Welcome to Genomics Unlocked, where genomic science and webinars converge. Today's episode focuses on spatial enhanced resolution omic sequencing, new frontiers of spatial multi-omics. So for those of you that uh, have recently joined us in our series, um, just to give you a background, so Genomics Unlocked is a platform for knowledge sharing and all things genomics driven on DNBC. If you haven't uh, not if you have not yet seen our Genomics Unlocked website, uh, please visit www.genomicsunlocked.com um, where you can subscribe to future webinars and then also view some of the previous uh, on-demand webinars that we have hosted before. So there's actually some quite cool applications that we've already uh, worked on and then also in the future. So please subscribe. Um, just to give you a background about myself, so my name is Brett Verderman. I'm the part of the, the product and marketing team here at MGI and it's a pleasure to be hosting you all today. With us, we are proud to welcome two esteemed scientists, uh, Dr. Yen Yu Lin and Dr. Yan Mulder, uh, who will present on spatial enhanced resolution omics sequencing and how StereoSeq can provide a, a powerful uh, research base to empower scientific and clinical researchers to efficiently interrogate biology at a, a spatial temporal scale. Um, and uh, Jan will also further um, talk about how its application in the Human Atlas uh, program to increase coverage and resolution. So just thank you all for joining the webinar today. And first is our, our, our first speaker is Dr. Yen Yu Lin. My wife looks like that. So uh, she's a, a senior field application scientist um, and the coordinator of the FAS team at BGI Research and Stomics Europe. Uh, she specializes in the technical aspects uh, within Stereoseq. She graduated with a doctoral, uh, doctoral degree in genetics from the University of Munich. She has over 10 years of experience in molecular biology and has experience in the transcriptic data analysis. Um, she's also supported in the establishment of Stereoseq workflow for research institutes in the in UK and in Europe, uh, and pro has provided um, advanced technical support for different Stereoseq platforms. So just without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Yen Yu Lin, and yeah, thank you for joining in the Genomics Unlocked webinar series. Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me clearly. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share the uh, webcam due to the limitation of my computer, but I'm happy to be here and happy to um, join this meeting together with all of you and hope we have a very nice discussion after the presentation. So um, today I'm going to introduce what is Derosic Stomix and how can it proceed with the uh, research project and how can it lead to us in the future. So if you can hear me clearly by now, then I will start my presentation. So we all know that the uh, development of sequencing technology starting from the um, eagering to know what the RNA expression in early or in night, late 19s. So start from the, uh, let's say, in situ hybridization stuff and also the previous technologies, things develop quite fast in the recent um, years. And our stereoseq, stomachs, or let's say in general, spatial transcriptomic technologies starting quite uh, fast since 2020. And by now we have several uh, technologies you can see different uh, from different brands. And several see it's quite popular at the moment and we are happy to introduce you what can we reach with TerraSeq. So you might know that the sequencing technology starting from the bulk analysis box sequencing where you can put the total RNA into um, the sequencing part as an input and then you got all the data as an output. And later we have the single cell analysis. You got the single cells as inputs and then you got the data afterwards. But now we have something really advanced that you can put a tissue section as your input, we capture the RNAs in situ and then do the um, transcriptomic sequencing, then reveal the atlas afterwards. Then you got the tissue expression level for those RNAs. That's how we have the sterile seek. 
on the benefits of the spatial technology in research fields that you can imagine. You can increase the resolution to every of the tissues and every of the sections. And then you can gain a lot of knowledge by using this um, technology. You can have different time points, different location, and use to uh, apply this technology to different kinds of tissues, smaller ones, larger ones. It's really, really powerful. And this special um, transcriptomic technology is the selected method of the year 2020 by Nature Methods, and also quite famous in the recent publication. You can also see it in uh, 2020, um, 22, for example. And what is stereoseq? What would be the stomachs that we are now talking about? So the stereoseq stands for Spatial Temporal Enhanced Resolution Omics Sequencing. With stereoseq, we are now putting a section of your tissue onto a pattern array chip. On this pattern array chip, we have tons of the DNA nanobol, stands for DMB here on these chips. And we now have each of the DNA nanobol as a detection point to capture the RNAs that you have in those tissue. And the distance between two, um, two DNA nanobols would be 500 nanometer center to center distance. And with these DNA nanobols, we have a CID, which would be the location of each DNA nanobol on this specific chip. And these CID will be sequenced after the chip production. So we know the location of every DNBs. And afterwards, we can ligate the probes onto those DNBs. So then you can imagine this DNBs now become quite hairy because we got a lot of probes onto it. And with those probes, you got CID, you got UMI, you need unique molecule identifier, and also the poly T in order to capture your RNAs. So this would be the part regarding to the production part that the user will not be able to see. What user will indeed did, uh, do in the lab would be the DNB, um, the, the procedure that I'm going to tell in the next slide. And with those DNBs, we incorporate DNB-seq from the MGI technology. Um, they provide the sequencer and this DNB-seq technology. So what is this DNB-seq? So as we are talking about the DNB-DNB, it's the DNA nanobol, which contains tons of the copies, around 300 to 500 copies from the original copy. And these copies form like ball shape because of the static electricity. And each of the ball will be on one of the location onto those chips. When we are doing the sequencing, these um, DMBs, it's under the um, circular amplification mode. So the copies that we have now, it's from original ones, different from the traditional PCR, you are amplify the products from the previous round of the products from the PCR. So in this way, we can use DMB-seq to lower the amplification errors and lower the index hopping rate. So the users indeed will do in the lab would be here. Procedure number four to number six, the experimental operation. So first you have your tissue embedded in OCT, for example, you did a tissue section, put one section onto the pattern array chip. Hello, Yen, we um, seem to lost your audio. Can you still hear me? Yes, you're back. Okay, good. Uh, just let me know if the connection is not so good or you cannot hear me clearly. So after the sequencing, we can reveal the spatial atlas of the tissue after we incorporate the genome reference, the image of your tissue by single strain DNA staining, which will represent the nucleus of the uh, cells, and then of course the sequencing data, and also the location of each DMBs. So then you can see the tissue expression atlas. And for the sequencing part, I'm just briefly to mention that we are doing a pair and sequencing. For the first part, we are going to read the, um, the code for the DMBs, and then the primers, for example, and also a unique molecular identifier. And then the second part of the sequencing, we're going to sequence the RNA that you are captured, which is reverse transcript to the cDNA, so then we can have them be uh, sequenced. And indeed, if you have several samples to be pulled together for one round of sequencing, you will have the sample barcode, which will be sequencing in this uh, second period.
what would be the uh, advantage or let's say why you are going to use Stereosync instead of others. So I would say if you want to get into a higher resolution to get more information from your tissue, from your uh, samples, three criteria is very important for this special uh, transcriptomic technology. So the first one is the detecting spot. What is the detecting spot? In our case, it would be a one DMB. So the size of the detecting spot matters. And then the distance between two detecting spots also matters. You can imagine in one limited area, if you have more detecting spots, then you can get higher, higher resolution. And then it would be the field of view. The field of the view in this case would be the chip size. What kind of sample you have? It is really small, like um, 0.5 centimeters squared or a bit larger, maybe two centimeters squared or four centimeters squared, for example, then you need to have different field of view for this tissue. So in our case, Sterilsig provide you the smallest detecting spots. Each of them would be 220 nanometer diameter. And between two center, two detecting spots, the center center distance is only 500 nanometer. And if you are considering the field of view, we have different size of those chips from 0.5 times 0.5 centimeter up to 13 times 13 centimeter, for example. Then you can have higher resolution. You can apply to various type of the samples, and then you can increase the understanding of your tissue of your research topic. And here I'm going to show you some of the publication data that we have um, in last year in this uh, cell. So here you can see compared to the existing technologies, we Stereosig here have the smallest spot size, the detecting spots and the shortest distance between two spots compared with the others. If you are talking about uh, in a limited area, you can imagine as we have the shortest distance and we have the smallest spots, you got the highest number in the limited uh, capture area. And of course, you are curious about the uh, um, capture rate or let's say the resolution. Here I'm telling you in this report you can see our capture rate or the um, gene that we that we can capture is comparable to the other technologies or even better. So actually you don't need to worry too much about this part. And here would be some examples of the um, chip size that we have. So, for example, the smallest one we have now would be the 0.5 times 0.5. The standard one would be one centimeter times one centimeter chip. And we can have them higher up to actually 13 to 13 centimeters squared. But of course, in order to operate with this kind of big chip, you need also a bigger size of the um, cryostat. And also, let's say, uh, when you do the image, you need a microscope be able to image this kind of um, bigger tissue. And then I'm going to tell you how Sterosic can be so powerful to reach a cell segment, a single cell resolution by cell segmentation. So as we are talking about different, um, let's say, different size of tissue, different size of the cell, you might be wonder how we can get to the higher resolution level with Sterosig. So this is because Sterosig offer you the different size of the bean to analyze your tissue, analyze your um, sample. So that means each of the DNA we have now can be one detecting spot. And then you can assign different size of the detecting spot as one um, category as one cell and then to mimic the size of your cell. So in this method, we call it square bean. So the bean, for example, bean one, it means one area with one bean area. If you are talking about bean two, that means it's two bean, uh, two DNA nanobols times two DNA nanobols. And if you are talking about higher bin size, it will be 3D nanobos times 3D nanobos or even higher. And these square bin can be transferred to a cell level. So how can this be done? Let's say in a mammalian cell, standard size would be 10 micrometer times 10 micrometer. 
in our case, we can apply 2 dn on 20, sorry, 20 dn on the both times 20 dn on the both in this square. Then you can reach a square bin, mimic the cell size. Of course, this is not the preferred way because cells that varies in shape and probably distribute in, in an uneven order. So we also have a cell bin analysis in case the square bin doesn't fit very well. So if you are talking about the real case, we have the nucleus like this, the blue ones, and then there might be some noise, some signals outside of the cell that you don't want. So actually, you, if you have the square bin, the bin size is quite square, and then you might not be able to detect every of the cell or to um, get the impression of the cell quite um, precise. But if we have the cell bin, it will be inferred to each of the cell. So then you can have the cell be um, located and identified. With this, it can be done by the algorithms that we have. So in this paper, you can see it's a brain section. So in an anatomic region, you can see the regions are divided by colors like this. And if we do a single cell or let's say cell bean analysis, you can see the clusters of the cells are quite similar to the regions represented here. And if we see in another case in axolotl brain, you can see the SSD is staining like this. And after the sequencing data, we do the data analysis, we can actually reveal the single cell here by different colors in different shape. So this is why zero C can be powerful because we can reach square, uh, bean square for square cell analysis, or we can really identify each of the cell and do the cell bean analysis. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the workflow and the potential application. So here, the workflow would be the sample preparation part where you have the tissue embedded in OCT, and then you can do the image to record the tissue shape, the size, where we do have the SSD and staining to the nucleus that representing each of the cell. And afterwards, you apply this to the um, the, this capturing chip, do the permeabilization, we can capture those mRNAs, reverse transcribed, and then collect those cDNAs for the library preparation, and then go for the sequencing, and finally the data analysis and data visualization. So in situ transcriptomics would be uh, more or less one day or 1.5 day, depends. We have a, um, a pulse that you can apply and then this would be for overnight reaction. And the second day, you can do the library preparation for the sequencing part. And the first day, it's about the sectioning, permeabilization, imaging part. So it's about like 1.5. Yes, we can. Yeah, you're back. You're back now, Yen. Ah, OK. Uh, then I guess maybe you lost a bit uh, in the previous slide. Um, I'm just mentioning that the DMB seq for stereo-seq or stomach technology can be done with the MGI sequencers, but I'm not going to talk in detail this part. If you have questions, you can refer, uh, find our MGI representative locally. So G400 or T7 should be fine with the stereo-seq. And then it would be for data analysis. Actually, we have the data analysis workflow provided. So you can have the data output as a FASTQ, as a GIF or GIM file, and then use our um, offline workflow to get your data analyzed. So in order to do this analysis, you need your reference genome, the fast field data from the sequencing, and the mask file. This mask file represents the location of each DMBs that we did in the production part in the first round. And then, of course, you can uh, input your image here because then we can register all of your uh, sequenced RNA or let's say cDNAs refer to the location of DMBs and then put those uh, all together with the image. So then all the information like the local or low mm, expression locally can be uh, incorporated here. So um, I would 
briefly present how it works with our data analysis tools. These are offline tools, so you can have it in your computer and then do the uh, analysis by yourself. So at the first part, we have the image studio. This is for the image processing. Then you can assess your um, quality assessment results, and then it will provide you one of the files that you can input to this SAW workflow afterwards. So then you can also do some um, pre-processing stuff if you need to um, adjust the contract, for example. And then after that, we have the main workflow that I was showing uh, in a previous slide. Then you can have your sequence aligned to the reference genome, for example. And after this part is done, we have the sterile map, which you can visualize your data as a um, gene expression heat map and do the clustering, for example. And real, uh, recently, we also have um, StormX Cloud that you can um, visualize the data with our cloud system. Then it's quite uh, real time active. So you can see if you can zoom in or you can choose certain uh, cluster of the cell. So it's quite um, useful and powerful. For the samples that accepted or can be uh, used with SteroSeq, there are quite a lot of variations. Of course, you might think about the human organs, your human tissues, and mouse organs, mouse tissues, but these are not the, uh, the only parts. So we can also did it with uh, plant tissues, with Drosophila, Zebrafish, Axolotl, which is published, and macaque, for example. So quite a lot of the differences. And the embedding material we are now recommending would be the OCT. Of course, the other one, for example, PFA and others can be discussed. And here I'm not going to tell into detail about the publication we have, but I want to show you some key points that SteroSeq can be done in the research field, which has been, which has been published. So these will be some examples here. So in these parts, actually you can uh, apply different time points to the tissue and then did a time course experiments and then reveal the spatial atlas during the evolutionary or the development stages. So this would be one example with the mouse embryo. And here I'm going to show you in case you did a constitutive section or you did um, several time staging stuff, then you can reconstruct the expression. So this would be one of the uh, mouse embryo here. And if you do uh, several sections with it, you can reveal the 3D expression pattern in this mouse embryo. All right. So due to the time limitation, I'm not going to um, play full of it, but then you can see how you can do with the stereostic. And again, um, related to the 3D reconstruction, one example with Drosophila larvae also did this constitutive sectioning and put them with the um, stereostic chip. So you can replay this 3D construction during development with the Drosophila larvae as well. And then another quite uh, interesting and powerful um, part we still will see is that in case your samples are really small, like an um, embryo of the zebrafish, you can indeed embed several of the zebrafish embryo in one tissue block and then apply this tissue block in one or of our standard chip, which would be one centimeter by one centimeter square. Then you can have bilateral replicates within one chip which would be quite powerful. And if you're um, talking about the capture rate or analysis, actually you can apply different bin size, as I mentioned previously, to identify the cluster that you want to, or to, um, let's say, identify each of the cells that reveal the real expression pattern of the tissue. If you have the bin size from a larger number, to a smaller number, actually you're increasing your resolution. So um, I'm now going to briefly talk about the product info and updates. Um, I think I'm running out of time. So if you have more questions related to the previous part or the later part, feel free to um, ask me in the later discussion part. So here we have uh, some service lab in worldwide, for example, in US or in Riga, Latvia, 
and also we have uh, Japan, Singapore, and UK Germany lab establishing. And we actually have several um, up upgraded features expected in this year. And at the moment, we have launched the chip on slide version and also an um, MIF compatible protocol. Of course, we are going to um, launch our FFPE compatible protocol and PFA compatible um, products as well. And of course, you can imagine as we are focused on different aspects of the research, you can expect a better algorithm and efficient uh, 3D reconstruction um, tools in the later stage. And we are now going to have the HNE standing compatible with um, stereo seek very soon. So here I'm going to uh, show you a few pictures that we have now. It's the chip on side version. So before we are now before we offer the chip on site version, we are actually upgrading the bare chip, the chip alone. So you need to use your first step to take one centimeter by one centimeter square chip around and doing the experiment on top of the chip, like um, dipping and stuff. But now we have the chip on site. So actually it's more convenient. And then you can have the cassette installed uh, with our slides. And we also have a PCI adapter. So you can have the slide directly into the PCI machine for incubating, etc. And if you have the oven, you can put the cassette with the chip directly into the oven if needed. So it's easier to operate now. And then we have the stereosic with multiplex immunofluorescence, which would be MIF. Actually, you can detect up to five different uh, antibodies at the same time. Of course, you need to consider the fluorescence um, with different antibodies and the overlapping of the signal if there's any between different channels. So for this part, we also have a protocol um, compatible with this. The users need to um, do the antibody titration themselves and test if it works, but then you can do the permeabilization and the transcriptomic experiments to see your proteins and then the RNA all together. Um, few examples here would be uh, in the mouse brain fresh frozen sample, we can actually capture um, over 10,000 um, gene in the bean 200 square. And then if it's a PFA fixed sample, as it's fixed with the um, performance high, so the gene detection, it's a bit uh, different. And here, uh, we can reach over 5,000 gene in the bean 200 square. And then one more thing to mention, which might be interested for some facilities. Um, we are now developing the automation system for stomachs. And these automation system can, um, let's say reduce your hands on time and it can operate up to 24 chips per day the procedure that it can replace the uh, main part would be to do the tissue permeabilization until the cdn release and the collection part so if you are interested feel free to um, talk to us talk to your local representative in a later point and then I am now going to the summary part. I would like to say that the spatial temporal technology, especially stereo C, can apply to special module mates if you want. And then you can also have your 3D reconstruction to different kinds of tissue organs. Of course, the cell clustering and segmentation can empower can be empowered by stereoseq and you can reach the single cell level with stereoseq and we also offer offline tools and online the cloud tools to visualize your data and with stereoseq it's a technology for high accuracy as we have the dnb seq technology for the sequencing and also for the uh, itself can reveal a subcellular localization and apply for different kinds size of your tissue. And now it's MIF compatible, so it's more powerful. And feel free to join our stock consortium. You can meet our uh, scientists and discuss with the users over there. So um, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Great.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Lin, for providing us insight into Stereoseek, uh, the application, the workflow, the products uh, to interrogate biology at a spatial temporal scale. Um, as uh, Yin Yu mentioned, uh, if there's any questions, please ask uh, after Dr. Jan Mulder's presentation. And if you have any questions, you can also just put it into the, the questions chat box in your GoToWebinar tool. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Jan Mulder who has completed two postdocs, uh, both in neuroscience, one at the Karolinska, Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and the other at the University of Aberdeen in UK. Dr. Mulder has been a part of the Human Protein Atlas project since 2004, and has built an immu immunofluorescence national facility at Life Lab in Sweden to assist Swedish researchers with multiplex analysis for protein distributions in a, a large variety of tissues, uh, which was then moved to a biomedicum to fully commit to the HPA project and create data for the brain section of the human protein atlas. He's now the group leader at the Karolinska Institute and uses transcriptomics and antibody-based approaches to determine regional and cellular protein expression and cellular and subcellular distribution of proteins in the brain of human and other mammalian species. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Jan Mulder. We're looking forward to hearing uh, more about your uh, the work that you are undergoing. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to share our work. Um, I will kind of focus this presentation on a little bit of our journey of trying to map protein expression and distribution in the brain. So we mainly focus on, on brain, which has special challenges, I would say. Uh, but also I would like to go a little bit into the spatial transcriptomics uh, approaches that we have been, we are working on at the moment and kind of give you a little bit of insight in the things that we have been doing during the last year and, and where we want to go with, uh, with the new technologies and the new opportunities. So first I would like to um, kind of for those of you who are not familiar with the Human Protein Atlas project. So it's a project which started in 2003. And our main mission and vision is that we want to map protein expression and protein distribution in all cells and tissues of the human body. And uh, that has been our, our activity over the past years. And uh, we have already uh, produced quite a lot of data and, and quite a, a few, many people know already about, about our resource. So one of the things is we want to make all our data publicly available uh, and create a kind of a knowledge resource for, for people to explore all types of information about proteins. And we are currently have 12 sections where you can look at uh, protein expression distribution in tissues, in brain, in single cells, uh, but also we have, for instance, uh, information about structure of proteins or um, proteins which have been secreted in blood, proteins which are associated with diseases. So there's all kinds of different sections which you can find within the Human Protein Atlas. And each of them will give some information about, um, about the protein that, uh, that, that, that you are interested in. We mostly use two approaches. Is one where you can give your candidates protein and learn lots of information about your protein. But also, for instance, you could search for proteins which are uh, enriched in certain tissues and certain cell types. So we'll be able to get lists of, of genes or proteins that are interesting if you're interested in certain types of tissues or certain types of cells. So this is the information that we have. We released 20, uh, version 23 of the Human Protein Atlas in June this year. And as you can see, we have data of lots of antibodies. So we are originally an antibody-based, uh, um, let's say, um, um, project. Uh, but also, and we have data about 17,000 out of the 20,000 pr uh, proteins uh, which you can find on, online. So, um, and then you can find everything on proteinatlas.org. So I will go a little bit more into uh, a little bit of the, the timeline of the, um, uh, of the brain, brain efforts that we have been doing with the Newman Protein Atlas uh, project. So as I said, so we have mainly have been started as a antibody producing project where we made antibodies against all protein coding or all proteins of the human. Um, and these we used to stain. So we use a lot of immunohistochemistry. And that started already from 2003 where we started producing the antibodies and also started staining uh, different tissues. Including the, the tissues that we have uh, in the Human Protein Atlas, we have also four regions of the human brain. Uh, and there's lots of images already available on, uh, on, on protein distribution in those, in those areas. 
So uh, we realized very, very early on that because of the heterogeneity and the complexity of the brain, it's necessary to visit one, many more regions than the four regions that we have traditionally included. So one of the first things I started doing within the project is to expand it by taking brains of a smaller mammalian species, in our case a mouse, and starting then to map the protein distribution in these mouse brains. Um, in 2015, our kind of first version of the Human Protein Atlas, where we had mapped most proteins, um, was released and we had a publication in Science. Um, and that was kind of our, our first version of the atlas where we had, I would say, about 85% of all proteins uh, covered. Of course, there's many proteins like olfactory receptors and, and other types of proteins which are difficult to, to detect and find. Uh, but we were able to um, to at least have the first first draft of the Human Protein Atlas. And this was a very interesting time because it was also the time where the next generation sequencing technology became, um, became available. And in the beginning, we were using a lot of RNA-seq data from, uh, or from uh, let's say, public, um, public release data to uh, validate our antibody-based stainings because we are also, in our effort to kind of map all proteins, we also had antibodies generated against proteins which do not even have a name or proteins that nobody had been um, had been working on before. So that means that we had very little information to validate our staining patterns. So uh, our using bulk RNA seq data could already help us to see if that you know if we if we see immune histochemical signals in tissues where we also see RNA, then of course that's a very good um, I would say chance that we have antibodies that actually target the proteins that they should target. So, but also we realized that when we released that data as a validation tool, that also many researchers were interested in the transcriptomics data. So transcriptomics data by itself is also something which is quite useful for the scientific community. So therefore we kind of started implementing more and more transcriptomics data into the ATLAS um, over time. And I will go through uh, several um, uh, implementations of, of these data into the ATLAS. Uh, in, two, in 2020, we released the first version of the of the brain section uh, where we implemented quite a lot of RNA-seq data, mainly bulk data. And then later on, we moved more into the single cell transcriptomics data, expanded the amount of samples and coverage of the human brain. And then we are slowly moving into, into stereo-seq, uh, which I will also show a little bit more about later on. So version, version one of the Atlas, which was released in 2020, so here we try to do a massive normalization uh, effort where we took data, mainly data from the um, from the GTEx portal, which contained several brain samples, but it was not covering all samples. But also we found that the Phantom 5 at the Regan Institute also had cage data on several brain regions. So we tried to integrate RNA-seq, both from the Illumina platforms and from the cage platforms, but also we tried to integrate data from mouse and pig and kind of create one kind of data set which allowed us to investigate protein expression within different regions of the human brain, but also to be able to compare between species. So that was our effort, which was kind of a long, uh, it, it took us quite a long time to find the best and optimal way of normalizing the data because you don't, you still want to kind of maintain your biological variation and you want to eliminate all your technical variation. So it can be quite, quite challenging, but we were happy with the results as you can see in the figure B is that we had quite a good coverage, especially in the other species, but also in human, we, there's still some white spots, but we at least were able to get some kind of representation of all the main structures of the, of the human brain. So, and this is after normalization. So you can see we use different type of um, platforms, as you can see with the different uh, square, uh, circle or triangle. Uh, but you can see that after normalization and we do a clustering and UMAP analysis, we could really nicely see that we saw that the samples were mainly clustering on their origin on the region rather than on the technology. Um, so that was kind of giving us the, the kind of the green light to continue our analysis. Um, in version two, we kind of moved on into a, uh, because we felt that it's not only the coverage, but it was also sometimes the sample description. So many molecular biologists, when they kind of want to include brain into their samples, then there's a sample which is called brain, or there's sometimes there's a sample which is called frontal lobe, but it doesn't really tell us the anatomical boundaries of the sample. It doesn't really tell us which cells are included and how much of each cell type is included. So, um, so this is a, a picture of um, Professor Miklos Palkowitz, who is a Hungarian uh, neuroanatomist. 
and he developed this punch method where he uses uh, punch needles and he's very skilled in punching out different parts of the brain, human brain or, or rodent brain, uh, with the rule that the punches should never be larger than the size of the nuclei or this area that you want to select. Um, and he has collected lots of samples over, over many years. So we use these samples to really try to get a more extensive overview of protein expression uh, within, the, within the human brain. Uh, and here you can see him at work. Um, and one of the first pilot experiments we did is we looked at the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is a, is a cortical area which is very, I would say, very well developed in, in humans. It gives lots of our human, human traits. It's, it's very important for also for uh, mood disorders. Um, and here we had the uh, we had 17 areas of the prefrontal cortex. So this is not only prefrontal cortex, but actually 17 different parts of the prefrontal cortex. And we also had three reference cortexes, which are uh, areas uh, from uh, from other pieces. And then using the punch method, we would be able to to uh, to um, to kind of look at the uh, difference uh, expression. I will show a little bit more of uh, things which came out, but this was kind of the pilot experiments. Uh, that we did and then based on the results of that we kind of extended it to other parts of the brain so here we give an overview of all different areas of the brain and at, at the moment we have more than 195 regions of the brain where you can find data on each of the punches and you can see there's several cortical regions but also we have other regions of subcortical regions that are um, that are uh, available so and i I'm, I'm i haven't seen any other data sets which have more coverage when it comes to uh, more brain regions and also using a sequencing based uh, approach. So there's of course lots of microarray data and other types of data available, but when it comes to um, genome wide sequencing technology, I think we have the largest collection of samples when it comes to coverage. So, um, so these are a little bit of, of what we have been, have been doing and I will go a little bit more into the things that we have been have found so far uh, and the type of data that you can find within the human protein atlas. So, so one of the things is that, of course, we were able to compare between species. And it's also one of the things is that, of course, other species are often used as a model for humans. Um, and also we talk a lot about mammalian brain uh, protein expression. But of course, what mammalian is and how much variation there is, is, is something that's not completely, completely known. But of course, everybody has been working on development, drug development, of course, knows the stories where things work very nicely in the model system, but the translation to the clinic is something that is not really, uh, really working very well. So, um, so we kind of look into it a little bit with the data that we had. This is still based on version one, so the data where we still had some missing areas. Uh, but we could see that if you look at the at the organization of the brain. So if you kind of ask the question is you know, which gene is specific for a certain region? So which, which gene do you find in one region or maybe in a set of regions, which is group enriched? And um, so how many how many proteins would you find in those different regions? You see kind of a similar, a similar distribution. So all species you see that in many cases, even the same genes, they are differentially expressed between different regions of the brain. So you see the same, it's kind of something to do with the specialization of certain brain regions uh, and associated or linked to certain functions. Um, and then also you can kind of also look a little bit in different protein classes or different groups of proteins. And here we looked at things which are involved in transcription factors or we have neurotransmitters. So things which are producing, so the, the genes which are involved in, in the, let's say, the production and release of neurotransmitters, receptors, and then everything which is kind of others, other proteins, which are the many other things that we have. And we kind of looked at the different comparisons between different species to see, do we see a similar expression of all these different, um, uh, different protein classes in different species? And we see, as you can say, a little bit is that if you look at the similarity, if you look at the blue one, so if you look at overall, is that there's a similar, let's say, distribution of the um, of the correlation between species if you look at the other proteins. Um, but especially when you look at the um, receptors, we saw quite a few, uh, I would say, changes or differences between between uh, different species. And I will go a little bit more into the into the details there. Um, so one is the transcription factors. So transcription factors are, I would say, the main drivers of, 
or one of the main drivers of, of differential expression. So many, many programs start with transcription factors or involve transcription factors. So we also know in the brain that for certain development of certain cell types, certain transcription factors are, are important and they, they really drive this, this differentiation process. And here I show an overview, and it's, uh, so where we see in, in, in the kind of the horizontal, we see the different main regions of the brain, the olfactory bulb, cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, basal ganglia, hypothalamus, thalamus, midbrain, pons medulla, and, and the cerebellum. And then we see in a different colors here, uh, we see the green, red, and blue, which are the different species. So here we have the human, the pig, and the mouse. So if you look at the relative distribution of the transcription factors, in this example, EMX1, you can really nicely see that it's in all three species is mainly associated with cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala. So these are the kind of the four brain regions where you find this transcription factor to be highly expressed. And this shows a few other examples of, of, uh, of, of transcription factors. And you can see that most of those transcription factors, they follow the same distribution. So it seems that those, those programs are quite similar in different parts of the of the, of the mammalian brain. So there's a mammalian blueprint of, of brain development and, and differentiation of, of cells within the brain. The region which was a little bit interesting was the olfactory bulb. So olfactory bulb is one of the brain regions which of course in the mouse is kind of involved in olfaction, which of course is for mice and pigs much more important and much better developed compared to, to humans. Um, so here we see that there's some, some difference, differences there, but in general you would say that many transcription factors that follow a similar uh, pattern uh, between species, which of course is kind of logical thinking about about the blueprint of brain development. Um, the same is for the different neurotransmitter systems. So we also know that in the same parts of the brain, in human, mouse, or pigs, you find the same type of of neurons. So for instance, dopaminergic neurons, you will find in the same areas of the mouse brain compared to the pig or the or the human. So and that's also one of the things that we we saw quite well is that. You see that many of the genes involved in either the production of neurotransmitters or the packing of neurotransmitters into vesicles, these are all very nicely and very well um, kind of between between species. Um, and we didn't see much, much variation there. However, one of the things that I want to point out is that when it comes to receptors, and that's very interesting because receptors are often the kind of the favorable targets when it comes to development of new drugs, we see that receptors are the ones which seem to be more variable compared to transcription factors or compared to neurotransmitter production. And as, as, as to kind of just highlight some examples, for instance, the serotonin 5A receptor, which you can see here in red here, is very highly expressed in, uh, in the cerebellum of both human and pig, but it's kind of absent in, in the mouse. And it's also one of the things is that if you look at the literature, there's very little known about the role of the serotonin receptor 5A in cerebellum because nobody has been able to study it because it's lacking in rodents and therefore there's very little information. A similar um, picture you can see here when it comes to the mu opioid receptor, you can see that this opioid receptor is even highly expressed, most highly expressed in the cerebellum of the human where it's not expressed in the pig or the mouse. And also there's quite little information about the function of this receptor in the cerebellum uh, of these species because of this, this variation. Um, I think it's one of the things that, that was one of the conclusions from this study is that maybe it's, it's kind of difficult to, to describe something as mammalian. And, uh, and it's, it's, we need to, we need, because often these are based on the comparison between one or two species and then researchers are e easily kind of taking the word mammalian um, kind of into their mouth, which might be a little bit tricky. Um, another, another, uh, these are sort of other type of, so we look at some of the GPCRs, which are more unknown. Uh, we see quite some variation. One of the things I found very interesting was this, this, this Opsin-4, which is a non-visual field uh, optic receptor. And it's very highly expressed in the basal ganglia of, of the human. Uh, and it's kind of, kind of a big question. I mean, what's this optic receptor doing in the kind of center of the brain? Uh, and why is it so highly expressed in, in human? It's also one of the things that, that we were able to, to identify based on the, on the comparison. Um, I will not go too much into, into details here, but also if you look at things, and it's more, mostly comparing to textbook knowledge, if you look at the textbook knowledge about, uh, in this case, nicotinic receptors, then you will see that most of the nicotinic receptors are either based on this um, alpha-4, um, beta-2, uh, composition or the alpha-7. 
and it very nicely works for mouse. Um, so you see that you know based on the uh, expression of the different subunits, you can kind of, kind of nicely see this pattern uh, very nicely fitting. But if you compare to other species, um, especially when you compare to pig, you see that this doesn't really hold. So probably the composition of nicotinic receptors based on all the different subunits is quite different between mammalian species. And it's not that straightforward. And maybe the textbook knowledge about nicotinic brain receptors is not um, as it should be. One of the things I found really interesting was, for instance, this, this epsilon subunit, which is highly, very highly expressed in the basal ganglia and the pig. So of course, we don't know whether this expression also means that they are integrated into functional uh, receptors because they built out of several subunits, but at least it kind of shows that um, it's not that straightforward. And I think it's important to to do a, a good analysis and a good species comparison in order to kind of develop your model system when you want to develop certain uh, drug for for certain diseases. Um, and that's a little bit about um, about about version version one and version two. So version two, of course, you can see that we already were able to fill in the blanks. And we even, I think we have an even better coverage and a better resolution than we have in the um, in the pig and the mouse because we had these very small little punches. Um, so therefore, I think we were able to, to go a little bit more and to investigate smaller smaller different differences and, and also see which are the genes which are involved in the specialization of certain, certain uh, brain regions. Um, as an example, so this is again the, uh, the, the prefrontal cortex um, experiments and this published last year in uh, in PNAS. So here we just compared 17 or we compared the overall gene expression in 17 regions of the prefrontal cortex and we found two distinct clusters and we, we investigated the neuropeptides. So the neuropeptides are one of the, the kind of the classes of, of proteins which are really really much involved in modulation of, of, of neuronal activity and also has been associated to, to uh, mood disorders and depression. So to see if we find some differences between those um, different parts of the prefrontal cortex, um, which we were not able to study before because we didn't have the resolution to compare between those very, uh, very closely um, related parts of the, of the prefrontal cortex. So we were very happy to see that with the analysis, we could, we could, actually, we could actually do it and we could identify very specific profiles and we could identify and at least map all the um, uh, receptors and, and peptides and peptide receptors and, uh, and then kind of kind of draw a map and I think one of the conclusions was that we found these areas which are mostly the basal part of the prefrontal cortex and the central part including the singlet cortex that those those areas seem to be very much uh, neuropeptide and neuropeptide receptor rich so it seems to be that neuropeptides play a much more or a higher or more important role in modulating those those circuitries uh, compared to uh, the areas which are more let's say on the outside and the, and the top of the of the prefrontal cortex so we were able to find this this quite quite nice and distinguished uh, differences another thing is i have to say is that the total amount of glutamatergic or gabaergic cells so the main neuronal types within those regions did not differ so it's mainly um, so we didn't find any overall changes in in glutamatergic or gabaergic cells but we found differences in the in the distribution of peptides and peptide receptors. Um, another thing is now that we have the version two is that also we were able to uh, use that, that resolution and detail to, to kind of ask or explore the protein uh, expression at, at a little bit different, uh, different levels. So one of the things we did is we, and that's even something that works very nicely, is that here we just used the 1900 or almost 2000 uh, transcription factors which are, are kind of annotated within the, the human genome and we just kind of clustered all our samples just based on the on the transcription factor content and this gives a beautiful map already of the different um, parts of the brain and in color you can see the different uh, regions the main regions like amygdala hippocampus cortex and you can nicely see that areas are nicely clustering based on transcription factors, but also you can see that, for instance, here we have the basal ganglia in blue, that we see that we have the nucleus accumbens as a kind of an, an islet, and we see that maybe the basal ganglia has several, uh, let's say, sub-regions or domains which are slightly different uh, from each other. So based on this analysis, we decided to take the kind of the main structures of the brain that we have been using since version one, and to kind of create 31 regions based on the clustering uh, which means that for, 
for the basal ganglia, we would have uh, three different different parts, which we can then compare individually. So that kind of allows us to look at um, at the differences between between septum and, and nucleus accumbens, for instance. Um, Another thing is that so here this is just a kind of an overview of all the transcription factors which are differentially expressed between between the regions and of course many of them are the kind of the known uh, transcription factors that we would expect there to be for instance the Hox genes which are really specific for spinal cord and medulla uh, but also some other genes uh, we found quite nicely differentially expressed between between regions of the of the brain and we are currently uh, exploring this data further so the data is released it's available on the Human Protein Atlas. Um, but it's not yet published, so we are still um, working on it. Uh, another thing is that this, I think, is a kind of a nice way of, uh, of looking at your protein expression, is to do a kind of UMAP clustering of your protein expression, but then you don't cluster, uh, let's say, regions based on their gene expression, but you cluster genes based on their regional distribution. So if a gene is, for instance, expressed in cortex and hippocampus only, then of course all the genes which are expressed in cortex and hippocampus only will kind of cluster together because it will be clustered based on their on their distribution uh, within the within the brain. Uh, and this is how the UMAP looked like. So the UMAP here contains 20,000 protein coding genes. So every spot is one gene, but they are clustered based on their distribution among the 195 regions of the human brain. And that kind of nicely gives us lots of lots of information, uh, especially when you combine it with gene ontology uh, or other types of, of data, single cell data. So it really nicely gives um, a kind of a map of proteins, which might be at least expressed in the same cells or they might be involved in the same cell processes because they are kind of often expressed together. Uh, and as an example, I just kind of plotted here uh, a list of, I think it's about 85 genes which have been associated with Alzheimer's disease. And these are the kind of the red dots. And one of the things we saw is that we saw this really clear enrichment into the clusters which have been associated with macrophages and monocytes, which is not that surprising because these are the areas of, these are the cell types which more and more become, it becomes more and more apparent that these are the cell types which are involved in, in many of the, of the disease processes associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and also we found a kind of a enrichment of these Alzheimer risk genes in a system associated with astrocytes and, and a complement system. It's also not that surprising. Uh, and also the thing that you can do is you kind of look around and see, okay, if I look at my FDA approved targets, do I find some targets which are kind of in the same area? So could we find some, let's say drugs which have been maybe utilized and created for something else to see if, if they would fit to uh, risk genes which are uh, which are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a kind of a nice way, and this is an example of of how you could use the data is to kind of get a little bit more of a a alternative angle of looking at protein uh, expression and try to find proteins that could be potential targets for 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 research. So that's all kind of you know what we have been doing, and of course the main thing is we are talking about spatial transcriptomics. So um, but I want to show a little bit what we have been able to do using uh, spatial transcriptomics type of approaches, even though I would say our micro punches are already something which kind of gave us a little bit more control over the anatomical boundaries of the samples that we included. But as you can see here, of course, we have um, we have se we have several, let's say, challenges when it comes to. And I think the main thing is that we're always struggling with is is resolution versus depth. So you want to have you want to basically have all transcripts. That would be the ideal thing. So you would like to have as many transcripts as you can to give you statistical power, but also you would like to have resolution. So you would like to have maybe cellular or subcellular resolution. So, um, and these things are often, it's kind of a compromise. So if you get more resolution, you lose depth. And if you get more depth, then you lose resolution. So, so these are the things that we, we are struggling. But I think the combination of all these different approaches will kind of, if you are able to integrate these, we were able to kind of answer the questions and be able to link genes to cells, cell types, and maybe even to function, and maybe even to disease. So these are kind of the things that we that we that we aim to do. And of course, as I listed here in 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 uh, on the right, each each method not only has the depth and the resolution as an issue, but also there's other um, I would say challenges that we have. So for instance, with single nuclear transcriptomics, 
one of the issues there is that um, I mean, how many sam how many cells do you need to sample in order to get a kind of good representation of all the cell types? And some cell types they are really rare. There's really only a few cells in your entire sample, whereas others will take over 80% of your samples. So how to be able to do a kind of an unbiased versus a biased approach. So how will you get a good representation of all the cell types within your sample? And for brain, it's extremely complicated. Another complication for brain is that you cannot get single cells. So everything should be based on single nucleus, where even on top of having the heterogeneity in cell types and the difficulty in capturing all the different cell types, it's also things like transcriptional bursts and other factors which kind of make your data a little bit difficult to, to interpret. So, so that single single nucleus is quite um, is quite challenging in that sense. Uh, the spatial transcriptomics has the the major advantage is that you kind of capture all. Um, we have to of course see if we capture all in enough depth because there we really have to be really pushing the resolution. Uh, as as Jen you said, we can go down to let's say 0 0.5 micrometer resolution, uh, but it also means that of course, how many how many transcripts can you detect on a single spot? And how many, if you kind of look at a single cell, which will be let's say a 20 by 20 um, DMBs. So how many, how many transcripts will you get? Uh, and will it be the same as you get from single cell? And will you be able to get the same amount of information to uh, differentiate between, uh, between cells? So, um, so these are the, the, the methods that we, we are exploring and using. And I think, at the end, I would say as, as a take-home message, I don't think that one method will give all the answers, but I think at the end, the solution will be a combination, a combination of different uh, methods uh, with different resolutions, uh, different depths, um, which will then kind of create the picture that we that we are all looking for and all aiming for. So a little bit about then our transcriptomics efforts. Um, so, uh, so we've been lucky that we have been involved in the development of the spatial transcriptomics quite early on and have been kind of uh, not so much in the technological development, but mostly in trying to evaluate what type of biological information we could extract from those type of experiments. Uh, because as a neuroscientist, I'm, I'm mainly interested in trying to try to really understand how the brain works and, and kind of what happens when the brain stops working and, and people get a disease. So that has been our, our main focus um, uh, all along. So this picture is the same picture as, as Jen you showed. So this is also what we use as a as kind of standard workflow and as a starting point for um, kind of creating the data and also exploring the data. Uh, I would say the data is in a way, uh, once you kind of go through the, the pipeline and cleaning up of the sequencing data, it's it's a very straightforward table. The only problem is that the table is, is, is enormous. So for each DMB spot, you basically have a list of all your, all your genes. So I would say data handling is, uh, is a challenge when it comes to, um, to doing your analysis that you want to do. Binning samples, of course, makes makes it much easier because then you kind of reduce your your size of your of your uh, expression tables. Uh, but the, the the standard pipeline works uh, works quite nice. Um, I would say the data analysis is also one of the things that Jen you said is that there's still a lot of development and there's uh, I would say there's a lot of people, lots of teams working on trying to really utilize the added value of having a higher resolution. So now we have a resolution which is less than a cell. So many of the tools available are trying to do a kind of integration of single cell data, trying to understand the cell composition of big spots. But here we have many spots. Uh, so we, we, I would say there's, there need to be different tools developed in order to be able to get all the information and resolution out of our uh, stereoseq experiments that within the next year, there will be more and more tools uh, available and it will become much easier to, to integrate these. Um, and then yes, this is the thing is that, that the experiment takes about two days, so one and a half, two days, uh, and then you get your, uh, your kind of your fast Q file. The standard pipeline of cleaning up data is very straightforward, but this will be something that we can do. But then of course you have to then do your other types of normalization, segmentations. Uh, you have to maybe integrate your single cell data or, uh, and then you have to do your extraction of biology and your data validation. I think that's something that takes a lot of time. So, um, so these are the things where the data sets are so rich and so enormous that um, in order to be able to extract all the data, it's something that uh, I would say you need some bioinformatics uh, brain power in order to be able to extract all the information that you, that you have. But one of the things which I really like about the methods, and that's the thing is that 
uh, even though, even if you're not a, a kind of expert uh, bioinformatician, the things that you can do quite easily is to just plot your UMI counts. You can just plot, you know, where do I find my transcripts? Uh, and if you do so, then this is what you see in the, in the second uh, the second image. So this is just the density of UMI counts. And I think, I mean, maybe I have too much fantasy, but, but maybe some of you kind of agree that you kind of see locations of cells. So this is a part of the cortex. And you can see that we see these hotspots of DMBs, which means that there's more mRNA molecules detected in these areas than in other areas. And of course, each spot could be one cell, it could be two cells, it could be uh, many things. But I think at least if you look at, for instance, a staining of, of brain tissue, this is something that you would expect there to be. And that's something that you don't need too much bioinformatics uh, to do so. Uh, another thing is that you can, of course, just, um, just print out your genes of interest. In this case, we have PLP1, which is a marker for, uh, for, for white matter, for myosin. So, um, so here you can see that just pr plotting your, and this is done in a bin, uh, I think bin 50, just plotting the location of your, uh, of your genes, you can very nicely see different domains of the tissue. Uh, and the same you can do for SNAP25, which is a gene for neurons. So you can also see quite nicely the differentiation between white matter and gray matter. Um, and this is something that kind of comes out of the box. Uh, you don't need to do too much, um, too much bioinformatics for it. Um, and you can use a kind of simple clustering analysis, which of course is not yet taking into account the location. So it's mainly based on, so in this case, we take bin 100 by 100. So it's just the content. So what, what transcript do we find within that, within that box of 100 by 100 DMBs? And how well do they cluster? How closely do they cluster together? And there you can quite nicely see white matter, gray matter, but also you can already see some, some layering, some cortical layers, uh, which is also something that works out quite, quite nicely. Um, so then, yeah, so, so, so as, as I said as well, so I think the different methods have different advantages, disadvantages, and I think at the end, the solution, uh, at least for me, will be an integration of different approaches in order to be able to get the depth, the, 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 the detail, and the resolution that I need. Um, so another another thing is that we are working on a lot is is on diseases and diseases have a have a I would say special challenge or have several special challenges uh, when it comes to especially sample composition. Um, so when you have a neurogenerative disorder, your sample is changing. So even if you're comparing cortex to cortex, one cortex contains lots of neurons, whereas other cortex might have less neurons or might even be completely um, I mean, neurons might have been completely degraded which means that if you use bulk transcriptomics that you see in those data sets is that all neuronal genes are downregulated and all non-neuronal genes are upregulated because also after normalization, you kind of really skew this, uh, this um, um, or you even, you even amplify uh, this, this effect. Um, and here we have an example of uh, frontal temporal dementia. So this is a sample where we have different cases of frontal temporal dementia. We have in green with the green boxes are the controls. And then we have yellow, which are mild FTD, and then we have the moderate and we have severe ones. And you can already see that we look at step 25, a marker for neurons, that you see this massive neurodegeneration, especially in the, in the red boxes, so where all neurons are almost completely gone. In contrast to, um, to the kind of loss of neurons, we see also an, an activation of astrocytes. And here we use the marker GFAP, which is a marker for, uh, for astrocytes and especially reactive astrocytes. And here you can see that you see an increase in the amount of GFAP expression. So here we see, and this is something that we, you will also see in bulk, but also we now have, are able to look at it in more detail and we can really normalize or we can really investigate gene expression kind of based on kind of by having the, the, the spatial uh, location, the spatial information. So I think I'm really helpful that now we can kind of overcome some of the limitations that we have when just comparing samples, and, and the same is with single cells. I mean, that, that we can overcome this by, by, by using spatial transcriptomics uh, analysis. Um, and this is the thing that we, that we are doing um, as well at the moment and try to see if we can really use this, uh, this information. Um, um, and I think that's, yeah, that's, these are things that they, they require still a lot of bioinformatics. So data we already have, but yes, we are, trying to find the best ways of integrating single cell data and also trying to find the um, best ways of exploring and utilizing the amount of information that we get from our, from our samples.
Um, so of course, this is one project that you know my group has been working on. But also, this is I would just want to say that the Human Protein Atlas project by itself is a, a huge uh, project uh, starting in 2003. So here on the on the right is Matthias Ulein, who is the director of the Human Protein Atlas, uh, has been initiating the project in 2003, and this is one of the last pre-COVID kind of retreats that we have uh, with the people who were working, I think it was 2018. So the amount of people working in the different groups kind of uh, creating data for the 12 sections of the Human Protein Atlas, uh, but also the collaborations I have with uh, uh, several, uh, oh, several, let's see, go back. Um, sorry. So uh, I want to also thank that uh, Professor Miklos Palkovic, who has been very nice to create the, data, the, the samples for the version two of the Human Protein Atlas and, and, um, and made those uh, available. Uh, and our collaboration with BGI as well, uh, who have been really not only part of the spatial transcriptomics uh, efforts, but also uh, lots of our samples have been sequenced on the MGI platforms. So also there we get a lot of support from uh, from, from from MGI, from BGI, uh, both data analysis and and uh, and, and sample uh, sequencing. Uh, and then of course, then I showed um, some data of the FTD. So this is done in collaboration with the uh, Erasmus University in, in Rotterdam. Um, uh, John from Seaton and um, and uh, Aro Selar. Um, yes, and then of course other collaborators uh, which are on this list. So I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Jan, for your insight uh, into the Human Protein Atlas and also the use of uh, stereoseq to interrogate tissues with increased resolution and representation. So we are uh, uh, out of time, but uh, I think we can just uh, have a few questions. So there were a few that came in. Um, so I'll start with Yen Yu first. So someone has asked, when is the stereoseq solution going to be commercially available in Europe? Thank you for the question. Um, actually, it's available in Europe now, so uh, feel free to contact us and then we can provide you more information. Great. Uh, here's another one. The stereoseq uh, is very interesting. The workflow you mentioned requires MGI sequences. Uh, is the application specific to MGI sequences and DMBC technology? Um, yes, so at the moment it's only compatible with the MGI sequencer. Um, of course, if you don't have the MGI sequencer in your uh, facility or institute, feel free to contact our um, MGI distributor or service provider. Or alternatively, we have a Riga StormX lab. We can help to sequence your library. Great. Uh, Jan, for you, um, the Human Protein Atlas, um, how many proteins have been currently mapped to date? And with Stereoseq, how has it benefited the research? Yeah, so uh, I would say on the level of protein, we have mapped, uh, we have antibody data of about 17,000 out of the 20,000 proteins. Uh, when it comes to transcriptomics data, of course, we have all, all proteins because, of course, we can detect all, uh, all transcripts. Uh, and I think there is still a small list of transcripts that we have not been able to identify because of, uh, I mean, some of the olfactory receptors and some really rare proteins where we don't have the tissues for, but I would say in general, we have, uh, we have um, data for all of them. Another thing which is very important to state here as well is that we will do an ensemble update every second year. We aim to do every second year, we take the new genome build from ensemble and we kind of remap all our data back to the new reference, which means that sometimes the amount of protein coding genes is also changing a little bit, but we kind of change our, our data set along, along with it. Um, so that's one, one thing. And then the second question was, is how spatial transcriptomics is going to kind of, what kind of data we are expecting to get from it. And then when it comes to the Human Protein Atlas, I think it will be, so what I aim or hope to do, or what we plan to do is that we will kind of provide uh, maps so, so when we have this gene-centric approach where you can look at an individual protein, we will also provide you the, uh, the kind of the overview images that I showed, the heat maps showing where that protein is expressed at the level of, uh, of, of tissue or single cells. So we really hope to be able to, to not only give you the regional 
expression level of proteins, but really be able to allow you to go into the details and find the location of proteins within different cortical layers, or maybe even within different cell types that are uh, located within different cortical layers. So we really help to provide a more zoomed in um, level of information that, that uh, our users can use. Well, that's great. Uh, regarding the tissue samples, Jan, um, for, so are the tissue samples in the tissue atlas from healthy individuals or patients from biobanks and how are they scrutinized? Yeah, so um, I would say we are using mainly uh, European, European brain banks, uh, which means that these are individuals which donated their brains for research and in Europe, because of our healthy, healthy, uh, I would say, or I would say our medical uh, efforts, most of those patients are quite old. And, uh, and of course, many of them might be in preclinical stages of any disease. Um, so in, in that sense, our samples are elderly and sometimes we can get uh, samples of, of younger individuals, but these are quite rare. So I would say in general, um, yes, our, our samples are a little bit kind of uh, biased when it comes to age. Cool. Uh, okay, two more questions. Uh, Yen Yu, um, can you comment what is the lowest resolution? So there was a mention of uh, 0.5. Uh, and what is the size of the chips that are currently available and going to be available? I'm um, sorry, what is the first part of the question? Um, the what is the lowest part? resolution that can be achieved? So you mentioned 0 0.5 micrometers. Uh, is there lower? And what is the size of the chips that are currently available? Uh, okay, I see. So actually, the um, maybe I answer from the back. So um, now we are having the standard one. It will be one centimeter times one centimeter square. And of course, we are now, not soon, for the smaller chip, it would be 0.5 centimeter square. Um, we have a bigger size of the chip, but then, of course, you need to um, order it in advance. It could be like one centimeter times two centimeters, or two centimeter times two centimeters, or two centimeter times three centimeters, for example. Um, if you want. Sorry, Yen, you uh, lost your audio. The class to order a larger one, uh, it's possible. Uh, just make sure that you have that and microscope also about the resolution, so the tissue type. So if you have a larger size of the uh, cell, then it could be easier to get your single cell resolution um, for the for the tissue. It doesn't really matter if you have a larger tissue, smaller tissue, or so, because our chip in any size it will be. Um, 0.5 micrometer for the um, center center distance and also 220 nanometer for the diameter. So it's only the matter of the chip area, like the size of the chip you have, but the dis detecting spots and the distance, et cetera, will be the same. Right. Uh, last one. Uh, Jan, is there a possibility to access or download some of the Human Protein Atlas research data? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we have uh, basically everything is downloadable. Sometimes we kind of keep some of the real, of the, the, the let's say, the raw data sets. Uh, we kind of release them upon publication. So, um, but in a way, uh, when it comes to the gene data, uh, also our previously published data, so everything is either you can, it's explorable, so you can go to the Human Protein Atlas and explore it, but also there's a downloadables, so lots of the data, so especially the, the version one transcriptomics data can be can be downloaded um, and can be uh, can be can be yeah, can be downloaded, explored, and also you're absolutely free to use it for whatever purpose. So the data is fully open access and can be used for both commercial and non-commercial purposes. Cool, great. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, both for uh, your time and your presentations today and enlightening us a bit more about uh, Human Protein Atlas and Spatial Enhanced Resolution Nomic Sequencing. So uh, that's it for today. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, please reach out to us via the email that's uh, indicated on our webpage and we'll get back to you soon. And don't forget to subscribe. So thank you and we hope to see you at our next one. So thank you, uh, Dr. Jan Mulder and Yen Yu Lin for your presentations. Keep all and goodbye for now. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye.